All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back for the second module of the program year 2023 EAP training. Um, so for module two, uh, we are going to be going over just um, general overview of kind of the intake process, the intake procedure, um, just kind of a holistic look at what the different steps are, what's needed for each step, um, and uh, and kind of what the expectations are. Um, and this really is in response to um, some messages, I think, that we've heard from the network as a whole, um, that uh, the network would appreciate hearing less kind of ambiguity uh, from ITDA concerning what exactly the expectations are. Um, and I think that would help with our applicants if there were some more consistent um, processes through the state, um, more consistent processes, more consistent procedures, more consistent expectations. And so um, that's kind of where this module training came out of. Um, so uh, I know that our time today is going to be pretty short and compressed. So I'm going to just get right to it. So if you bear with me for just one moment. All right, so uh, sorry about that. EAP intake overview for program year 2023. So during this uh, training, we'll go over in the intake overview. Uh, some common errors that we've seen at IHCDA that you uh, should probably keep an eye out for. Uh, expectations with regard to communication with applicants, uh, expectations and requirements, and then just some best practices. So generally speaking, intake consists of three major steps. There's documentation review, then there's a household eligibility review, and then there's a benefit eligibility review. And we're gonna go through each of these in order. So first, the documentation review. This consists of intaking reviewing the application documentation to ensure that all required documentation has been submitted as part of the application. Uh, so for any application, obviously the first thing you're gonna need is a fully completed and signed application a photo ID for the head of household submitting the application on behalf of that household, proof of social security number for all household members over one year old, income documentation for all household members, all adult household members that is, utility billing statements, and any other documentation needed based on specific household circumstances. First up, the application. The application form must be fully complete, com fully completed and signed by a household member age 18 or over. The application may not be signed by a non-household member unless that signing party has power of attorney for a household member. If the signing household member is not an adult or if an online application is submitted with a minor listed as the head of household or applicant of record, then that household must submit a new application. If the application is not fully completed, the intake must obtain the missing information. Um, so you kind of have two choices here. Uh, the first one is the intake may return the application to the applicant along with an incomplete letter and instruct that applicant uh, which fields must be completed in order for the application to be completed. Uh, alternately, intake may confirm that information telephonically through email or through a face-to-face -face conversation. If this happens, the conversation must be documented in case notes. Uh, if it's conducted through email, then you can just upload that discussion thread to the uh, to the application documents in order to do to provide that documentation. Next up is the identity documentation. In order to confirm identity of household members, the following documentation is required. A state or federally issued photo ID for the head of household that's submitting the application and social security number verification for all household members age one or above. 
Now remember that the photo ID and any social security number verifications may be pulled forward from previous year applications as long as that household has previously applied in your territory. If any household member is unable to or declines to provide their social security number verification, the household member may be counted as an ineligible household member. Um, to refresh your memory on that, whenever you have a, an ineligible household member, uh, they do not count as a household member on the matrix. Um, however, you still must capture any income uh, for that person because that is that is income coming into the household. Um, because that does have a negative impact on eligibility, the household must be given the opportunity to provide this documentation before you process a household with ineligible members. In order for a household to qualify, there must be at least one eligible household member in the dwelling. However, note that that eligible household member may be a minor as long as that application is still being submitted by and signed by an adult. Income documentation. So income documentation is required for all adults in the household, as well as any benefits received by adult payees on behalf of any children in the household. <clears throat> and this documentation can include documentation of earned or unearned income, uh, and that may also include bank statements if they're if they um, are are receive benefit beneficiaries of a fixed income uh, benefit. Uh, an income verification affidavit, printout of uplink records for unemployment or fully fully completed Department of Workforce Development last known employer request, or a completed request for earnings statement. So note that in general, uh, we count gross income and not net income. This must be kept in mind when giving applicants guidance on how to successfully complete an IVA. Note that applicants may not redact or alter income documentation they provide. Uh, for instance, an applicant who receives Social Security income and provides a bank statement may not black out all the other lines on their bank statement. If that applicant does not wish to provide an, an unexpurgated bank statement, then they may provide an SSA benefit letter. If an applicant provides an uplink printout or an, or an SSA benefit letter, then remember that the entire document is required. For example, partial screenshots of the uplink statement may not be provided. The applicant must download and provide a PDF of their history. If a Social Security award letter is submitted that says page one of three, then you must request the other two pages. Utility documentation. So for regulated utilities, such as metered electric, metered natural gas, or prepaid electric, the most recent or current the most recent or current account billing statement as of the date of application is going to be required. And the billing statement must include the vendor name, the customer billing name, the service address, keeping in mind that the service address may be different from the billing address and it must be specified, the account number, and the breakdown of usage or charges. For your Bulk fuels or unregulated utilities, the most recent or current account billing statement is required if the vendor provides those account statements. Otherwise, the most recent delivery receipt may be accepted. Um, you can also usually contact that vendor and get kind of a um, point in time uh, account statement. Billing statement or delivery receipt must include the following information. The vendor name, the customer billing name, the delivery address, again, keeping in mind that may be different from the billing address, and if there are two different addresses, that delivery address must be specified on the documentation and the account number. Once again, all this documentation must be complete. Uh, for instance, payment return coupons, not, except, not accompanied by a full uh, account statement, um, or only the front page of a multi-page bill, is not considered to be acceptable documentation nor is a screenshot of a customer's overall account status. All account details must be available to be reviewed and evaluated, including, once again, that delivery or service address, uh, services that have been provided, and usage or charges. 
If the utility is in the name of a non-household member, then a utility affidavit will be required along with the account statement. And we have other documentation. So other documentation may be required depending on the household circumstances, but they're not going to be required for everyone. So these may include, but are not necessarily limited to, utility affidavits, absent household member affidavits, proof of home ownership and ER consent form, proof of disability if a household member claims that they are disabled but does not receive an SSA administered benefit, proof of military service, landlord affidavit if the utilities are included in rent, and the direct benefit payment uh, election form if the utilities are included in the rent. All right, so now that we've gone over the uh, the the review of the documentation, let's move on to household eligibility review. So when conducting when conducting the household eligibility review, intake is to consider only those factors that contribute to overall eligibility for the program. And so that is the Indiana residency, dwelling characteristics, household composition, and household income. If any documentation related to this information is missing as preventing intake from being able to accurately determine eligibility, and in that case, that application is to be considered incomplete and an incomplete letter is to be sent to the applicant. If information is missing, but it's not the applicant's responsibility to provide it, um, for instance, applicant provide a DWD last known employer request and intake is waiting on DWD to return the results. The application is to be placed in in progress status rather than the incomplete status. Moving on to benefit eligibility review. Once household eligibility has been determined and the household has been approved, intake may, may begin to determine benefit eligibility. For eligibility review, intake will require utility information, uh, and that's going to be your billing statements and account information, and at-risk or vulnerable population documentation if applicable. Benefit eligibility review is to be conducted upon household eligibility approval. If the at-risk or vulnerable population documentation is requested from the applicant, Intake shall note the date that the request was made to explain why benefit eligibility review is being delayed and note the date that the documentation is due. If the applicant fails to return the documentation by this date, intake shall proceed with the benefit eligibility determination without awarding that at-risk status. So basically the bottom line there is we want to give the applicant the opportunity uh, to to provide that documentation to show that they that they do meet that status and that they are eligible to receive that extra funding. Um, we want to we want to provide that opportunity, but we don't want to uh, to have the process drag on and on and on. Note that our MOA with vendors requires that they cooperate with LSPs and IHCDA by providing customer information upon request. This does explicitly include billing statements. If an applicant does not turn in a billing statement for one or more of their utilities, intake is not to mark the application as incomplete, nor are they to send an incomplete letter to the applicant requiring them to submit the information. Instead, intake is to contact the utility vendor in order to request a copy of the account statement as of the application date. If the applicant does not turn in the correct billing statement, um, for instance, uh, the billing statement provided is from two months prior to the application, then intake shall request the appropriate dated billing statement from the vendor. In most cases, IHCDA expects benefit eligibility review to be completed and claims added to approved applications at the time of approval determination. In cases where additional information is needed, IHCDA expects that the claims will be added within 14 days at most from the date of approval. All right, and now let's go through some common errors that IHCDA has seen um, over the past couple years with regards to some of these processes. So uh, one of the biggest ones I think that we've seen has been conflating that household eligibility determination with benefit eligibility determination. 
Um, so we've seen cases of households being marked incomplete uh, for utility bills. Um, being marked incomplete for uh, a photo ID or social security uh, number verification when that person has been a long time applicant and um, you know there might be five years worth of scans in the system uh, containing that ID and those uh, social security uh, cards. Um, or or kind of marking someone as incomplete or even denied um, due to a, uh, a an outstanding deposit or uh, or an inoperable heating source. Uh, denying households for failure to turn in social security number verification when the documentation exists in previous year's application file. Um, and beyond the uh, beyond just the documentation existing in previous year's application file, uh, we've also seen where um, where a household has been denied because one person in the household did not turn in a social security number verification uh, when multiple other people in the household did have that documentation. Uh, so in that case, if the um, if if one household member is unable or unwilling to provide that um, after giving them ample ample opportunity to to turn in that documentation, uh, the correct way to proceed would be to just mark that person as an ineligible household member. Uh, failing to deny an application when documentation is not received after the due date on the incomplete letter has elapsed. Uh, so that's something that I think, especially this year, um, I know that a lot of you have had um, staffing difficulties, um, but unfortunately, I think that one of the unintended consequences of, of those staffing difficulties is that um, pieces like that, that really kind of hold applicants accountable um, to follow up on their on their own applications has um, has sometimes kind of fallen by the wayside. And so we've seen where um, where households might have been issued um, an incomplete letter given 14 days to turn something in. And sometimes it's months, um, months before they are actually denied for failing to turn that in. And unfortunately, it's a situation where if they would gotten that denial letter in a timely manner. They might have been able to get that information together. Um, they might have been able to reapply. Um, I have seen those denial letters go out at time um, when the reapplication period has closed. And if it had been done in a more timely manner, then they would have been eligible to reapply. Uh, and so unfortunately, we're really taking opportunity um, away from our applicants to, uh, to try to get it right. Um, and it's really having a negative impact. So if we are going to send out that incomplete letter saying that we are going to deny if you don't submit it within 14 days, we need to follow through on that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, denying an application for failure to submit utility bills uh, or for outstanding utility deposits, uh, excessive account credit balances, we've seen those denials before. Um, uh, inoperable uh, heating equipment is uh, is a denial that I've seen in the past. Um, we just really, really, really need to draw that line, um, as I talked about in the first module, between here is what makes your household eligible for the requirements of this program versus here's what we need in order to be able to pay a benefit out to your heating vendor. Um, those are two different determinations, um, and the second one should not be happening until after uh, the first one has happened. Uh, essentially, other, other, than, other than just making sure you have the documentation during that first step, um, when, when, when intake is doing the household eligibility determination, they shouldn't even be looking at the utilities yet. And so really kind of changing the approach and thinking of them as distinct processes, I think might be able to help with that. 
Uh, some other common errors that we've seen, failure to follow up with a household to determine if a member marked as disabled but who does not receive an SSA administered benefit has documentation to show they meet our definition of disabled. Um, you know, if if someone marks on their on their application that that someone in the household is disabled, um, we really we really do we really do want them to to receive that benefit if they do meet our definition. Um, and so, what we've seen a lot of is so I think we've seen two things. I've seen I think um, we've seen uh, intake just mark that household member as as disabled even if they don't uh show any documentation that supports that um i think that in recent years i think uh because we've been educating more on it we've been seeing a bit less of that um but i think that unfortunately what we're seeing now a lot of is if um if someone is marked as disabled but they don't have the um the social security minister benefit um i think we're seeing more of people just not just not being marked as disabled um, without requesting uh, that documentation. Um, and just to refresh everyone's memory on that, um, in order to show that um, that they meet our definition of disabled, what we need is uh, we need a we need an affidavit to be completed by a medical professional. Um, stating that the person does have um, a, a, a disabling condition uh, that um, that prevents them from working and that is expected to last, I think, at least six months. Um, so we just need that to be signed off on by a medical professional with their um, with their contact information. Uh, it should not have any um, actual identifying information about the diagnosis itself, just that there is a diagnosis. Um, and they also need to show some sort of proof that they have um, they have either applied for Social Security administered benefits um, or if they've already applied and denied and been denied that they are appealing that denial. Uh, so those are the two pieces of information that um, that would show that someone who is not receiving Social Security administered benefits might still meet our definition of disabled. Um, <clears throat> big, big, big one that we see is using incomplete or inappropriate income or utility do uh, documentation. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of, I think, just uh, screenshots of people's, you know, like an email from, from their utility vendor just saying, um, here's what your balance is. It's not showing any usage. It's not showing um, a service address. Um, we're still seeing some where it's just the uh, just the payment return coupon that's attached to the bill uh, where you're supposed to detach there and send it back with your with your check. Um, or just partial screenshots um, that I think, especially with the with the online portal is a big one. Um, where they take a screenshot and it doesn't even show the whole the whole of one page, let alone a multi-page bill. Um, a lot of first pages of multi-page bills um, <clears throat> of incomplete uh, award letters, um, redacted bank statements, uh, things like that. Denying a household for failure to turn social security number verification for a household member rather than counting the household member as ineligible. I talked about that one earlier, so I sort of jumped the gun on that. Um, but yeah, uh, we do see a lot of denials for that. Um, and while it is appropriate to send out that incomplete letter and to give someone 14 days, that's a situation where after that 14 days, we don't want to deny right off the bat. We actually want to just proceed with processing and just mark them as an ineligible member. Um, and then marking in an application is incomplete when waiting on information from a vendor or the DWD. Um, and that is something that with the with the online portal and with more people adopting the online portal, we want to be um, we want to be intentional about how we use that incomplete status because so if we're waiting on information from a third party, um, 
that really does not have anything to do with the applicant. We're not requiring anything more from the applicant. Um, and when we have applicants going in and checking their status and it says it's incomplete, um, that really sends mixed signals and causes confusion and some and some anxiety uh, with with a lot of our applicants. Uh, so we want to be sure that we are um, using those using those status markers appropriately. All right, uh, moving on to applicant communications. So these first these first few pages are going to be very similar. Uh, but I just want to be very um, intentional about what the what the nuances and differences are here. So upon determination, then application is incomplete. Um, and again, for our purposes, incomplete means that you need some sort of documentation or information from the applicant. Intake is required to provide written notification to the household of their status, what is needed, how to submit that required information to the LSP and the date the, the documentation is due. The LSP is to notify applicants of this by using the incomplete application notification letter generated by the statewide database. This letter be, be, may be mailed by postal mail or if the applicant provided an email address and opted into email notification, it may be emailed. The notification letter may be supplemented by a phone call or a system notification within the statewide database, but please note that these notifications may not replace the official notification letter. Um, there, there is information on the notification letter, um, most notably, I think, the, the appeal rights documentation um, that we are federally required to provide. Uh, we are supposed to be providing that that appeal rights notification every step of the way. And so that is why a, a system notification really does not, it, it doesn't cut muster uh, when it comes to notifying applicants of their status. Uh, we need to send out these, these actual letters. Um, and like I said, email email's okay as long as they're, they're opted in, um, but we need to actually send them. So uh, upon determination that an application is approved and after benefit determination has been completed and claims entered into the statewide database, intake is required to provide written notification to the household of their status and benefit levels. Um, once again, LSP is to notify the applicants of this by using the approval application no uh, notification letter generated by the statewide database. This letter may be emailed by may be mailed by postal mail or it may be emailed so long as the applicant has provided an email address and opted in for email notification. Um, and once again, you may supplement this letter with a phone call or a system notification within the statewide database, but these notifications may not fully take the place of sending out that official notification letter. And upon determination that an application is denied, intake is required to provide written notification to the household of their status and appeal and reapplication information. The intake is to notify applicants of this by using the approval application notification letter. Uh, sorry, that should be denial application notification letter generated by the statewide database. This letter be, may be mailed by postal mail or if the applicant provided an email address and opted in for no email notification, it may be emailed. Uh, this notification letter may be supplemented by a phone call or system notification in the statewide database, but these notifications may not replace the official notification letter. Um, also a side note on this one, intake must accurately record the denial reason within the statewide database for tracking purposes. Um, so this, this past year, we, um, we, we changed the denial process so that there were sort of three, I believe, different denial uh, reasons. So there was over income, um, there was uh, a denial for incomplete uh, application, and there's denial for uh, any other reason. Um, that other reason I think is gonna be your least common, um, and that might be things such as um, 
if someone has been barred from the program for uh, for fraud or noncompliance. Um, I, I really off the top of my head, I don't really know what else there would be. Um, and and we did that um, we did that for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason was so that we would have um, we would be able to kind of steer the denial letters to address the reason the specific reason why they were um, denied and to kind of give guidance on on what the next step is. And the second reason is so that we can track um, at the state level. Here are the reasons why people are being denied. Um, here's where here's where things are. Here's where balls are being dropped. Here's you know, we have X number of applicants who applied who were above income uh, guidelines. We have this percentage of applicants who um, you know did not return documents even after being followed up with. Um, and what we saw this past year was, I think, the overwhelming majority uh, of of LSPs ended up just defaulting to making it the denial for other reason. Um, so that makes our efforts to collect data on this um, completely moot. Um, so this year, uh, we really, we really do need everyone to make the effort to accurately record that denial reason within the statewide database. Um, you know, I was hoping to get baseline data on on the denial reasons uh, this past year, um, but unfortunately, this is now being pushed to this year. So this is going to be my baseline year. So please, please, please make sure that you and your teams are recording those accurate denial reasons uh, when you are denying applicants. And from the communication standpoint, please note that the LSP is to be the primary point of contact with the applicant. Um, intake is not to direct applicants to call IHCDA directly uh, concerning their application or their benefits. The LSP instead shall attempt to address the applicant's issues. If escalation is a, it, to IHCDA is necessary, that escalation shall be made by either intake or the LSP manager. Um, you know, get all of the relevant information. Uh, let us know what the issue is and then escalate it to us. We will research it. We will we will get back to you, let you know, and then you can communicate with your with your applicant. Um, you know, we had. Was it? One hundred and thirty two thousand applicants, I think, for program year 2022, 135,000, somewhere, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, we we just we are not able to to promise um, that we can follow up with people. Uh, we are we are not in a position to be the the primary point of contact. Um, I I know I know that's difficult for you as well, but you know a a, a territory a, tor a ter territory with um five thousand or eight thousand applicants um, compared to you know uh, our team of just a handful of people trying to respond to one hundred and thirty some thousand applicants um, it's just not realistic. Um, so I so I really I really would like to see everyone make a concerted effort uh, to please try to to streamline um, this process and set that expectation uh, with your applicants that uh, that the local office um, is is their point of contact on this. All right, uh, moving on to best practices. LSPs should consider an internal tracking system to ensure that they track incomplete applications, uh, receipt of missing documents, timely denial of applications in which the applicant fails to return documents, as well as applications in which <clears throat> DWD or vendor information is requested. Uh, ensure that all of your applicants have easy access to multiple methods of turning in documents. Minimally, all doc all communications with your applicants should ensure that the LSP mailing address and phone number are included. 
an email address is strongly recommended. Uh, and as talked about, I think during the first session, um, if you, hey, if you still have uh, a fax number, uh, feel free to include that as well. Uh, when you are communicating with applicants, especially concerning timelines on things, um, please consider not getting into specifics with their timeframes and rather use the guidelines. Um, so if someone turns in an application and they call and they want to know when they're going to be approved, um, best best practice for us would be, you know, refer to, refer to their application date, let them know that the guidelines say that you have 55 days from that date um, and that they should be making attempts to, to pay their bill um, or make arrangements with their utility in the meantime. Um, if the applicant is asking about their direct benefit payment, um, then refer to their approval date on their approval letter and the 120 day, day timeline that was disclosed on their, on their approval letter. Um, please, please, please remember, um, once, once you turn in something to IHCDA fiscal for, um, for payment, uh, it still needs to go through our fiscal uh, review process, which typically takes roughly 30 days. Um, and so we kind of have that, knowing that you have to do QA on those on those direct benefit payment um, files, we kind of have that built into uh, that, that timeline. Um, but I mean, I did have several, several, client communications this year um, where, you know, we kind of got a, an email or voicemail saying, you know, X agency told us to call you because you handle the checks. I haven't gotten my check yet. And it's been, you know, five months. And then when I go in and look at their case, I see that, well, it has been, you know, they were approved five months ago and, um, and it was, uh, it has been submitted to IHCDA fiscal, but it was just submitted within the past two days. Um, and so, and so, unfortunately, that's something where there's nothing we can do until that's turned into us. Remember that that does take 30 days once it's turned into us. Um, and so, we really need those uh, those to be submitted in a timely manner. Um, and we will be talking a bit more about that probably on Thursday. Um, but uh, while we we're talking about best practices and the timelines, I just wanted to kind of throw that in there as a side note. Um, and I repeated that here on this page. I'm sorry about that. Uh, when sending an incomplete letter to an applicant, be sure to review all documents and fully determine everything that is missing. This will avoid having to send multiple incomplete letters to the household and will lead to a more efficient eligibility review. And this is something that I saw a handful of times this year. I'm not going to say that it was a widespread issue, uh, but I saw it, you know, more than a few times uh, where someone gets an incomplete letter saying, oh, your your application is missing this. Person sends it in and then a month later they get another incomplete letter saying, oh, we looked at it again and now it's missing this. Um, when you're sending an incomplete letter, you really want to be sure that you have fully checked the documentation and you're asking for everything all at once uh, rather than rather than um, from the applicant's point of view, that's going to look like moving the goalposts on them while they're going through the process. Um, and it can be really, really frustrating and disenfranchising. So we just want to be really aware and cognizant of that. Uh, always accurately track the application status. Um, like I said, if remember that remember that the online applicants can go in, uh, to, can log into the portal, and they can always view their status. So we want to be sure that we're not causing them any undue anxiety or confusion um, by inaccurately tracking what that status is. If in doubt about anything, please feel free to reach out to IHCDA. Um, we would rather we would rather field the question and consider it um, and be able to give um, you know some well considered guidance. 
uh, then have to make a determination on something when it's already been done and there might potentially be uh, negative consequences either for the um, subgrantee or for the applicant. Um, you know, so please, please, please be be um, proactive uh, with reaching out to us with any kind of gray area situations, um, with anything that you're not sure of, um, anything that you're not quite sure how to how to interpret it. Um, and I know I know we've talked about this a lot in the past, but remember, as a general rule of thumb, whenever intake has to put their hands on an application for whatever reason a case note should be left. If anyone has to go into an application to review something, to add something, to look at something, try to just make it part of that routine that they leave a case note and just briefly describe why they went in there. You know, was did this person return information? Um, you know, especially once we start getting um, calls at IHCDA, um, concerning concerning applications that might still be um, incomplete or in progress. Um, it's really helpful if we if we can have the full context of of what that communication has looked like for, from the uh, from the LSP's end. Um, you know, a lot of times when we when we do get those calls and I'm having to reach out to you guys, the only thing I have to go on is what the is what the uh, applicant has told me, so I'm only getting their side of the story. Um, and so if if you have a process where your side of the story is automatically in there and available to me, that is having that context is so, so helpful for me and can also be uh, less stress for you, um, because then when I am reaching out to you about it, I'm more fully informed about kind of both perspectives on the situation. Um, and, you know, as as Renee and I have repeated ad nauseum, uh, I don't know how many times I know you guys are tired of hearing us say it, but the application has to tell the entire story. And ultimately, if it's if something isn't documented, then. For all intents and purposes, it really didn't happen. So this has been a particularly difficult for me one for me to to talk through without um uh because I'm pre-recording this and I'm not having the the live uh live feedback from people. Uh so I hope this made sense. Um I hope that this helps to clear up any of that um vagueness or ambiguity uh that I think that a lot of you uh sometimes sense from our policies. Um, I hope that this helps make those expectations clear um, and that can lead to uh, to better consistency um, for both subgrantees and uh, and our applicants. Um, as uh, as we already talked about, we will be having the Q and a session uh, on Tuesday, August second during the time when we normally have the listening session call. So please, please, please prepare any questions that you might have. Um, be sure to bring those to that session. Uh, feel free to email us the, any questions that you might have in advance so that we can. Um, I think the more questions we get in advance, the better prepared we can be. We can kind of have those answers prepared for you and be able, you know, especially if there's something that we might need to research or discuss on our end. I would love to be able to to research that or to have those discussions and be able to have answers for you on Tuesday. Um, so please feel free to send those to me. Um, but otherwise, um, we will be back with you tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, the uh, the 26th. And um, and thank you so much for your for your attention. And uh, this will be posted to the ICDA Partners website shortly. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your day.